Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Hello. How you doing? I am so, so excited you're here because I finally have someone to talk about one of my favorite things with. Well, mm -hmm. I have a lot of favorite things, but this is really one of my favorite things. So mm -hmm. I know this is going to be a juicy conversation and I can't wait to get into the details. So I just want to say welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm pretty pumped about it myself. All right. Well, let's start with you introducing yourself and then letting everybody know what you do. Sure. So I'm Lisa I'm from New York. Um, live here now. And I, um, gosh, where do I start? I mean, there's so I'm so multidimensional. I don't know which thing to go with first. I guess <laughs> me too. The reason, the reason you asked me to be here is um, my love of selling jewelry and in particular selling it on live shows, which is an yeah. offshoot of my overall reselling business, which I've been doing since um, the spring of 2021. Um, something that I'd wanted to do for much longer than that. I actually majored in fashion design in college and uh, had dreamed of being a designer, but life had other paths for me. And um, I ended up actually spending, I still am in corporate America, um, had left my fashion dreams behind and was working in the city until the pandemic. And it was like, wow, it'd be so amazing to do reselling, but it just doesn't seem feasible with my schedule. I have kids, full-time job, commuting into the city. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And I was like, well, I work from home now. That gives me more sort of space and hours in my life to do stuff. And so that's how I got into, um, into reselling, which basically my favorite thing in the whole world is shopping, like literally. <laughs> I love to shop and I love di getting discounts on stuff. And reselling basically merged that together with uh, shopping, doing so with a discount. And even better, I don't know if you ever say this to people, but I basically say to them, I get paid to shop. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. Basically <laughs> making money shopping. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this is like, like m me professionally. I'm actually also a certified coach. I'm, I primarily do executive coaching with it, but actually also um, sort of how I ended up entreeing reselling was I was uh, doing some coaching for people, um, like image coaching, like consulting with them on their their look, their um, you know emotional baggage connected to their appearance, um, inwardly and outwardly to build their confidence. And I had a client who was trying to grapple with her life changes, making her not no, need the same wardrobe anymore. And she had all of these beautiful, like sexy designer shoes and cool dresses. And she's like, what do we do with this? Should we like donate it? And I was like, I feel like we could sell this, right? So that's actually how I got into officially into reselling. Um, but yeah, other than professionally, I'll just also say I'm a wife and a mom of two um, amazing uh, kids. I have a puppy and yeah. I am nonstop, 24 hours a day, basically. Yeah, I totally can relate because I'm a mom too. Uh, mm -hmm. I only have one though. I think that's pretty much all I can afford. <laughs> but um, but he's 15 and he's fabulous. Okay. And uh, so it just, I think a lot of moms, doesn't matter how many kids, what your situation is, a lot of moms do this because mm -hmm. it is so flexible and it is something enjoyable. Yeah as it relates to part-time work, side hustle, side gig, that type mm. of thing. And so that's kind of how it really started for me too, was at a necessity. Mm. And then mm -hmm. moving into jewelry, again, mm. that was out of necessity because I used to sell everything mm. and anything, Okay. but uh, because I didn't have a lot of space, I didn't have, mm -hmm. you know, a storage unit. I didn't mm -hmm. have a big garage to put tons yep. of stuff in. And so that's when I realized I need to deal with smaller items and items that I actually enjoy looking for. And that's where jewelry came in for me. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, what you say, it makes a lot of sense because I think so many of us are in that same position. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I have um, when I started reselling, I did a little bit of jewelry, but I was primarily doing just women's fashion, contemporary sort of mid range fashion. Uh Pretty much at the, at the time I started, I was mall brands all the way up to, you know, starting to get designer goods. What ended up getting me into jewelry was I had stumbled upon a 
um, online auction um, that had a bulk jewelry um, that you could buy. Mm -hmm. And I had bought it and it was just so much jewelry. I don't know if you've ever bought in these bulk auctions. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was like sitting there detangling it for hours. Um, anyway, I had thought about selling it and then I hadn't really gotten into it too much. And what ended up happening was that I, um, I had started doing live shows in on Poshmark in October of 22 when I was at Posh Fest. Uh, they well, so actually, I'd been offered the alpha of the live shows on Poshmark, and I was too afraid to do it, and I turned it down, which is funny because I love talking to people. But I was like, I don't know, something about it was created a barrier for me. And then at Posh Fest, they're like, "You're here. Everybody who's here at Posh Fest this year can get early access to live shows if you sign up right now." So one of my very first shows, I was doing bags. That's what I was doing. And I had this box, this like big box full of jewelry. And I was like, you know what? Maybe like this is taking up, you know, space here. Why don't I just like offer it all for like one flat price, right? So I'm like, oh, look at this whole huge box. It was like a shoebox size thing of jewelry. And people like scrambling, they wanted it. And then they're like, do you have more? Do you have more? And I was like, I wonder if I could, I mean, I could buy more of those bulk boxes, right? Like, couldn't I just do that? And it sort of spiraled over time um, into something much, much, much bigger, which I can talk about. Um, but now I exclusively sell jewelry in my live shows. Um, and I'm moving towards a closet that's probably going to be at least 50% jewelry, if not more, um, especially because I have so much of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I totally get it. And you and I are kind of doing the same exact thing because mm -hmm. I only sell jewelry on Poshmark live shows and I absolutely mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. And it has been amazing. Now, I was a little hesitant at first, just like okay. you, because um, I was so nervous. And I said, well, what if nobody mm -hmm. comes in? And, you know, what mm -hmm. if I'm talking to myself? You know, all those things we think about or it's just yeah. because it was so new and so unfamiliar, you know, a few years ago that mm -hmm. I, I was, you know, kind of nervous, you know, <laughs> about doing it. When, but when now. Did you start? Um, Remember your live show date? I don't remember, but I know it was like, I haven't been doing them that long. I want to say only about okay. a year because oh, okay. I got approved mm -hmm. early last year, but I didn't do my first show right mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. because I was nervous, you know? know. So, but now mm -hmm. I wish I would have done it from the beginning because mm -hmm. I love it so much. And mm -hmm. Uh, for me right now, it's really the only way I sell is doing live shows. I haven't listed really? on eBay. Yeah, I haven't listed on eBay in months, <laughs> which oh is gosh. probably not good. But um, well, I, I, I do three shows a week on Posh, and then I do three shows a week on Whatnot. However, oh, okay. however, though, I've mm -hmm. been having way more success on Poshmark. So I've been mm -hmm. focusing my time mm -hmm. there. But the thing is, is. I need to show up on whatnot too, because I want to grow over there, but it's, it's really hard. And on Poshmark, I have no trouble mm -hmm. getting yep. people in my shows because a lot of times they're waiting before I even start. There's people waiting for you to come yeah. on. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you do your shows and, and how okay. you structure them and, and all the, all the things. <laughs> okay. So, um, I do shows, I'm, I'm an every Thursday night person. That's when I try to do them with very little exceptions because I do think that your audience starts to count on you and they need to know when you're gonna show up, right? Um, my shows are really um, small, they're niche. Like I even niche down in jewelry. Um, I used to, when I started, I was ordering so much bulk inventory, like I talked about from auctions. I couldn't, I could barely have time to sort it all. It was like, I had a room full of jewelry and I was like making boxes based on category, boho, vintage, Southwestern, etc. And I would just lot up like 10 pieces a lot, $2 a piece, $20. Because at that time, my buy price was something like 25 to 50 cents an item because a lot mm. of these lots that you're buying they're just like jam full of stuff and so like right. you get a couple hundred pieces every single box this was of course at a time when it wasn't as oversaturated a lot more youtubers are actually talking about some of the inventory sources for getting a lot of these bulk boxes which is driving the prices right. up but back then it was so cheap so for months i was doing this just these bulk bags and i would like literally and i'd give them fun names i would call them like you know Boho Chic, um, Vintage Vantage. And I would list the names when I would do the listing for the shows and people just loved it. Um, I was selling at the heyday of that. 
I was doing probably seven fifty to a thousand dollars a show. It was nuts, but it was a massive amount of volume and a massive amount of work to like right. literally get that much inventory, detangle that inventory. Because when you're going to get that inventory that cheap, it's not pre-sorted. It's not really looked at. It's like, I mean, my fingers would be like my the skin would be coming off my fingers. Cause I'd be like detangling things for hours. I started paying people to detangle things. This is <laughs> what point I got. But I was so burned out. What really turned me around. And I don't know if you've had this experience as right with like, you know, how reselling can be a really all the time job. And I work mm-hmm. for a job. Mm-hmm. Um, my kid said to me, all you, all you do all the time is sort jewelry. They're like, even when you hang out with us, like I'll sit with them while they're doing something and I'll just be like detangling. They're like, I, I want you to hang out with me. I want you to play with me. And I was like, no, that's not what I got into this for. Right. Uh-huh. I got into this so I can maybe afford vacations for my kids more than we could on my salary or, you know, because it's fun for me as like a side hustle, but not to replace time I should be spending with them. Right. So I pivoted to an individual piece model. And then from there, I recently niched down about three months, four months ago into vintage jewelry exclusively. Okay. And so my shows are very niche, right? Because first of all, if you've been in Poshmark shows, unless you're like selling Louis Vuitton or you're one of a couple of those really big like name people or you have like a Skims palette um, or you're a big YouTuber, I find that the shows don't have a ton of people in them personally. That's what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Um, For my shows, my average show can have as few as five and as many as 15 buyers, but I can still do on a really good night like five ish hundred dollars in jewelry. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Um, and, and frankly, you know, and we should talk about this more too, cause I'd love to compare strategies, right? <laughs> I'm, I am thinking about where my growth is going, what my business model is, how I want to do it. Um, so, you know, for me, although the money obviously is why I'm doing the shows, it's also the connection with people, but yeah, my shows are Thursday nights. Um, I do them at, the, I try to do them around the same time also to make it easier for people to find them. Um, and I, I'm on, okay. So when I first started, this is crazy. The very first show I did accidentally ended up running for five hours. That was when I was sold bags and I sold out my first show. I had like, cause that was like, no one was doing live shows. So I had like 70 people in it. I sold, you know, all 35 bags I brought to the table, whatever. But, um, you know, I was doing five hours for a long time. And that's, this means that I was up till two in the morning, then trying to wind down from that, go to sleep, wake up at seven, take my kids to school, start my my job. Like, what was I doing? Right. I normally go to bed on a good night at like, I don't know, 10, 30, 11. So I ended up deciding I was giving myself a hard cut off at midnight. There are times I go over and like last night I had a family emergency. So I ended up ending a little early, but generally it's around two and a half hours that I'm live for. And I have a whole setup. Um, I basically film from my couch. My first couple of shows, I stood and I was like, this is tiring. You're standing. For oh, like yeah, it is. Right? Right? <laughs> yes. So I'm like, I'm going to do this sitting. So I have a ring light. Um, I have a couch. Like I do it on my couch. And I have, as I've gone through more and more and more shows, I have like a real like formula down. So jewelry is so small, as you know, right? I, I, I can end a show and have sold $500 and it all fits into something smaller than a shoe box. So I have a whole yep. like plastic box system. So I have the box for the things that are going to um, have to go out. They, they're getting shipped. I have a box for all my supplies. I've got my ring uh, measure. I've got a pair of scissors. I've got um, a... Um, like a magnifying glass. If we need to look at like, you know, if this piece is signed on the back, um, I've got a um, measuring tape. If we need to check the circumference of a bracelet, mm-hmm. um, like I've got all the stuff, I've got extra plastic baggies um, and Sharpies. And I'll talk more about that too. Um, oh, you and I probably do kind of a similar system because okay. I have the same thing. <laughs> so I used to, I mean, at one point I was photographing every item, like you kind of do on whatnot, like photographing every item and like putting it in the show. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like, screw that. This is right. All about <laughs> right. We, we are tech disciples, right? So tech right. And disciples. So um, I label my show either A, B, you know, A through double A or whatever, or I do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So like, I have no idea what I sold someone if I don't label them. So every exactly. single piece is bagged. 
And every time afterwards, I write the username of the person and the number of the order. And then I, and I put that into the sold box. So I always have Sharpies with me and all that kind of stuff. I also do unboxings. That's my new thing. People love it when it's raw, right? Like when you're surprised as they are of what's coming out. So I also have to keep extra baggies because most of those, it depends on the, the order. Since I buy smaller lots now, a lot of them are sorted or bagged, but sometimes they're just like still in there. So I have to have bags for that. Um, I have like my whole charging station with my, I, I bought an iPad, like a used iPad just for doing like the second screen for the show. Mm-hmm. Um, I have my phone charger going. I, I have my ring light charging. Like it's a whole, I got this thing down to like, it used to take so much longer. Now it takes like 10 minutes to get set up for the show, but I break it down after every show because it's in my office and I, I can't really keep it there. So it's all about precision. Yes, exactly. And I have, I have a very similar setup. Okay. And, uh, and the nice thing is, is I learned from a clothing reseller because one of the things that was really hard was Mm -hmm. doing the listings, right? Like, you know, when you, when you schedule your show and you have to put your listings in manually. Yeah. Well, what this clothing seller taught me because she does live shows too. She has one listing that she Mm -hmm. keeps in her closet Mm -hmm. and and I hope I can explain this so people don't get confused because it took me several times to figure it out. But what she does is mm-hmm. she has one listing, right? And it mm-hmm. says it's jewelry live show okay. listing or whatever. Mm-hmm. And she puts the quantity, I think she has like 900 Ooh. something, 999, right? That's mm-hmm. the quantity of it. Mm-hmm. Then she puts sizes number one through a hundred. Okay. So I'm running item number one, right? I'm going to click on that listing and it's going to be size number one, right? I write number one on the baggie. Boom. I'm on the same listing for the next auction. Shush. I'm running item number two, but it's Mm -hmm. size number two on that listing. Did you just change my life? (laughs) Yes. Because now you don't even have to preload you just, you set that up one time and then exactly. you pick that item for your show. Exactly. And you know how, I don't know if Poshmark has changed this, but remember how you could only do 50 items on a tray? Yeah. Well, now I can do a hundred because my sizes are one through a hundred. Right. Wow. So now, wow. then when the mm-hmm. buyer gets their order receipt, mm-hmm. they're going to see they bought size number two, size number eight, mm-hmm. size number seven or whatever. And then the baggie has that size. So they yes, know. Exactly. Right. The same number. Okay. Yeah. That's so they know, do. oh yeah, this is what I bought. And then they can see that they got the right items. And I don't have to do listings for every show. All I do is add that one listing to every live show. Because remember, it's a quantity of 999. I think that's the most you can do, I think. So it's whatever you can max out on yeah. for the quantity of it. But what's so brilliant about that, which is one of the things that annoyed me, is that if something doesn't sell in a live show, people can see it in your closet, I believe. It just says not for sale. And it'll mm-hmm. just be like a random gray picture. And it'll say something like yeah. 40 on it. Your method cuts that out completely. Ooh, I feel like Tech would be so proud of you for this one. Though I guess you did co-opt it from someone else. But he can be <laughs> proud of you for, for co opting Well, if anyone is curious to see this listing mm-hmm. in action, you can just go to my Poshmark closet, the oh, great will. tab. And mm-hmm. I'll link it in the show notes and I'll link your closet as well. But it's amazing because now all I have to do is add that one listing to mm-hmm. my live show. And then I start on size number one, size yeah. number two, size number three. And then I just keep going. And so it helps the auction go so fast because I don't mm-hmm. have to type anything in. It's just the item number corresponds to the size number. And I mm-hmm. tell people that too. Like when they're coming in the show, I say, hey, if you know, if you're buying something, mm-hmm. your item number is going to correspond to the size mm-hmm. number of this listing. Because the thing about Poshmark is that it does not give us access to the replay, like on whatnot. Right. So if like if God forbid I forget oh, I know. Oh, who bought this, like I would have no way. It's my biggest fear. Yeah, I would have yeah. no way of knowing. So I make sure that I write a number yep. on the baggie. So that way I know, oh, okay, she got size number five so or, she got, or whatever. Now so, what happens, what happens like 
once you've sold size one or two or whatever in your next show, are you doing 101, 102, 103, or are you refre you replenishing your sizes in your closet? Yeah. I just go back to, um, mm -hmm. I start because it's a new show now. Okay. Right. Close so, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that show and all my shows have different names, right? So it'll be jewelry clearance. Uh, I don't know, gemstone jewelry. So yeah. oh. on the gemstone jewelry Got show, it. number one went to so-and-so. Mm -hmm. But let's say my next show, I'm going to call it jewelry clear out. And hmm. so on the jewelry clear out show, somebody bought number one. So every show has a different title and you get that oh. too. Yeah. yeah. When you get that, um, you get that on the, um, the order. order. Yeah. yeah. You get that on the order. So, you know, mm -hmm. oh, this is the show. Right. You can also search for it by date too. So I know on this date, yeah. You know, you can even type Ooh. the date in your title, whatever, you know, this if you want really to talk it that way. I love it. So okay. I love it too. It has been a game changer for me yeah. because like I said, I don't have to do a gang of listings <laughs> for every right. show. I just add they, that one listing. They don't take a super long time, but I will say I do find it annoying that they then sit in your closet as like additional listings that marked is not for sale. Like I just don't like the visual of that. So I think- Yeah, I don't cool. either. But that's mm -hmm. why I, I, I push them down basically. So right. what I and do I think is it even conceals them from other people who are looking at sold things in your closet and seeing all of these random little numbers and not having the context for them. Cause it's just one, one item. Oh, I love this. Okay. But the thing is though, Yay. is it's kind of good because if you're mm -hmm. working towards a uh, posh ambassador too, mm -hmm. all of those listings count right in your, in your oh, uh, posh stacks mm -hmm. your stats. <laughs> so Cause you know how you have, you have to have so many yeah. uh, listings and you have to have so many solds and all but that. Can, but can we talk for just a minute about Posh Ambassador and how it actually means nothing? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> I was already a Posh Ambassador too when I went to Posh Fest in 22. And they're like, Posh Ambassadors and Posh Ambassadors too, go over here for your special access. Like we walk over and they're like, here's a pin. And Posh Ambassador too, you get another pin. <laughs> and I was like, I would like more stuff. Like I have not literally seen any, any proof yeah. that being an ambassador has any value whatsoever. And frankly, I think it should, but I also think they should raise the stakes on it. Make it that to be ambassador two or whatever you want to be, you have to sell like a lot, a lot. You know what yeah. I mean? Because yeah. I think that the the ambassador two qualification is still only like 50 sales. What is it? 50 sales total or is it 50 sales a month or what, whatever it is. It's like yeah, whatever it doing, is, if you're doing real volume like we are and because I also sell in my closet too. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I'm a small potatoes compared to a lot of other people, even though I'm really, you know, proud of the, the sales that I have. But like, I mean, if you go to my sold listings on Poshmark, right. Or like the, you know, the, the details on you when they show like your profile, you know, I have like thousands of sold listings already at this point. Right. So I'm like, whoop de doo I'm a posh ambassador too. Well, the only thing that I've heard that it matters mm -hmm. is in customer service. So, but I've never mm -hmm. had a, an, an issue where I've had to contact mm -hmm. them. But mm -hmm. from my understanding, if you're a posh mark ambassador mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. uh, and you send an email in, like if you have an issue, they get to I yours guess. first. And in that's theory, the only yeah. benefit I've I've heard of. I don't know that I've really taken advantage of that benefit. Yeah, much, I have not either. But I'm not, I'm not sure, right? Since it's behind the scenes, like no one's like, well, because you're a posh ambassador too, I'm going to give you this, you know, refund for something. Like, I guess I don't really see it in action, but I do think that it could be a much more valuable program than it is. But I could say that about a lot of things on Poshmark. <laughs> I totally agree. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and the thing is, is, Comparing Poshmark Live to Whatnot, I really, I, I enjoy Whatnot because they have so many features that Poshmark mm -hmm. does not have. However, mm -hmm. it's much easier for me to sell on Poshmark because, I mean, not the, and that's the, another thing that doesn't really matter is having mm -hmm. a lot of followers on Poshmark. That doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's so much easier for me to get people in my show than it is on Whatnot. Like Whatnot. <laughs> whatnot. I've done some shows where I'm literally talking to myself for an hour. Posh yeah, I tried whatnot too, I actually. Um, I would, you know, honestly, if I had more bandwidth, I do one show a week and that mm -hmm. is still plenty for me. If I had more bandwidth, I think I would do one whatnot and one Poshmark show a week. So I could truly give them like a, a testing opportunity to see and develop and grow. Cause I really do believe 
in the power of whatnot. And I do still think it's early enough that you can make or break, you know, you can really break in still there. Like you don't have to just already have been a famous YouTuber or been one of the first people. But I, I do think that I had a little more trouble understanding some things on whatnot. And I consider myself pretty savvy, but even just some of their like reporting pages were a little bit trickier for me or they're, you know, the whole thing where you have to enter the weight estimates in for everything. The was shipping like is the hardest part on whatnot. Yeah, because I had people that were going into having to get a second order because I had missed or, you know, second shipping charge because I had missed estimated weight. But then I had said that I would, you know, pay for shipping over a certain amount. I don't know. I'm sure with just a couple of hours, I could get myself right on it. But I did do a thing for a while where I was splitting, doing half my show on whatnot, then closing out whatnot and going to meet my Poshmark friends and mm -hmm. doing the rest of my show on Poshmark. And I was like, oh, maybe I can sell cheaper things on whatnot too, so I can get myself started there. But I just feel like it's a time thing for me. And right now I am focusing on Poshmark Live, but I really, it nags at me that I'm not doing whatnot. Like, well, the other thing too is like whatnot jewelry is so saturated. Oh, mm -hmm. Poshmark, it's it doesn't seem to be that way to me. Like there's more clothing sellers yeah. doing uh, Poshmark Live but there's not as many jewelry sellers on Poshmark Live like there are on whatnot. Whatnot, mm -hmm. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a ton, a ton of jewelry mm -hmm. sellers yeah. over there. Yeah. And all of them are selling vintage jewelry. Really? You know, well, I shouldn't say all, but I would say at least 80 to 90% of them no. are. And there's wow. certain there's certain sellers when they're mm -hmm. on, I know nobody's going to come to my show <laughs> because they're going to no, be in, in their, in their shows. Sure. sure it does. <laughs> but, but I kind of think, I do think in some ways it's like, if you are a whatnot person, even to this day, if you can continue to work on it, it could be like being one of the first 10,000 people that was on YouTube. Like, I think it could really still lead to that kind of success for you if you really work on it, but it's true. Maybe it wouldn't be in the vintage jewelry niche. You know, I was buying other jewelry for a long time. Um, but then I happened to notice that when I had vintage pieces, it seemed to be like something that people really were getting behind. You know, they were really excited about them. And I became excited about learning about it, which is, I think, what's been fun about it for me. So, um, I mean, I don't even wear vintage jewelry, but like right now I've niched down to that, at least for the live shows. And what I find really nice about it is, you know, a lot of times people have not have basically not bought something during a live that I'm like, I can't believe no one bought this. I go I and listen on Poshmark, eBay, Etsy, sells in a, here's a good example. I, I think it was a scarf slide. It like literally, I've never even heard of a scarf slide until I did live shows. <laughs> it had like a bucking like cowboy on this, like it was like pewter looking and it had like a little cowboy on it. And it was like, um, you know, uh, on, a, on this little scarf slide and no one bought it in the show. And I was like, you know, I did a little research on it. It didn't look like big seller, like huge money, but I was like, I don't know, I'll just post it. It took it. Jewelry takes like two seconds to photograph. Like it's the easiest thing to photograph. So I posted it. It sold in 12 hours for like 18 or $20. I probably was offering it for seven bucks on a live show. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So like there, and, and this has happened a million times before I once tried to sell, I had a Barbie from, it was the 50th anniversary reissue Barbie, original Barbie from about 2009 or something like that. I don't know what the date was. And I offered it on my live show for 49 bucks. And, you know, I think to people in live shows, they're like $49. So no one bought it. And it was right when the Barbie movie was coming out. I listed it in my closet. It sold for a full asking price of $150. Crazy. It is crazy. So I do think you do have to think about that though, too. And sometimes I will admit I have taken something out of a box and been like, like this happened to me once. It was this pen and it was a pen that looked like, um, like a, a sort of tribal design woman. And it was very, very odd. I didn't even know it was a pen at first when I picked it up. I was like, what the hell is this? It looked like a tiny sculpture. Right. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, it looked like maybe that she had a little damage. Like there was like a crystal missing from her, you know, head wrap. And I'm like, I feel bad for this lady. We should sell her. Like I'm about to like run her for five bucks in the show. And I see a stamp on the back of her. And I'm like, I get, get out my little, you know, uh, magnifying glass. And I see it says Florenza. And I know about Florenza. Oh. 
right? A little bit. I mean, I'm learning. I knew Me nothing. Too. Me started. too. I, I know a little bit, <laughs> a little bit about a lot. <laughs> so I said, guys, I'm just going to put her aside and we're going to check on her, you know, and I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, Google lends her after the show. I was like, Oh, even without the rhinestone on her forehead, I'm pretty sure I sold her for about $75 within like a month of having her listed. So there are definitely times where something comes up and my gut just tells me, look, girl, you have hundreds of pieces you could sell to people. Just put this one aside for a second and check it, you know, and some, some lots I also don't do as unboxing. Some things I just, I have a tray, like a box of things I want to sell in any individual show. I get like, um, I love when I get like a lot of pendants because I feel like there are certain categories that when you buy the lots, the people that are making them don't pay as much attention to them. So they like put things in them that turn out to be worth money. Mm -hmm. I found this little tiny globe and it was just kind of fun and interesting looking. I don't know why I just decided to lens it. It was like basically made of precious gemstones um all different like crystal gemstones and is like this very unique very very uh, highly collectible vintage globe and i sold it for a 100 bucks i mean it was this big in a bag this big full of pendants you know what i mean and i don't even think i would have sold it on a live show i probably would have been like oh no one's gonna buy a tiny globe pendant right so like what i love about how i'm getting into vintage jewelry is that i'm both being able to sell a lot in the show but I have been, I don't know, you don't, I guess you don't do it in your closet anymore because this is what I love to compare to. The sell through is so much faster for me on so much of this vintage jewelry than I was ever seeing on purses, shoes, and clothing. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Blowing my mind how quickly it, some of this stuff sells. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mm -hmm. used to sell clothing. I still have mm -hmm. some handbags and stuff in my closet because I right. love handbags. Like I said, if I had all the space in the world, mm -hmm. I probably would <laughs> just do jewelry and handbags. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. And the thing with the jewelry, what I'm noticing is selling mm -hmm. it in, in a live sale. I can sell a lot of it yeah. in volume. Mm-hmm. Right. But then you kind of go, you kind of struggle with this. And I'm sure you've heard it before okay. the uh, fast nickel versus the slow dime. Oh. So it's always kind of like, I'm trying to figure mm -hmm. it out. Like, do I just want to sell this stuff fast and get mm -hmm. some money mm -hmm. or should I list it on eBay and wait for the right buyer and get my full asking price? <laughs> okay. So I ask myself this all the time because mm -hmm. this is the funniest part. Okay is my resale journey has been a, like really, really interesting. I'm um, also, I come from a data and analytics um, in marketing background. And so I love looking at data. I love thinking about it. Yeah, and I had actually created it before I was using shows a little bit separately, but, but because of shows, I'd also decided to do this. I've pivoted to a high ASP or I had pivoted to a high ASP model in my closet. I was like, if I'm not going to make like a 30 plus dollar profit on an item, I'm not even going to list it. Like I had to stop myself because items are so plentiful that you can sell for 20, 25, $30 yes. that, you know, that's what tech talks all about the time, right? If you just want to sell $20 things, like you can find them all the time. Right. Um, but I was like, I'm moving away from it. I had built up my working capital for the business by not spending a lot of the business money on anything but the business. Okay. So I'm able to, I had, I do not blink an eye about spending 50 or even a hundred dollars on an individual item. If I think it's going to sell high. And as a result, I have very frequently made a hundred dollars plus profit on an item, right? So this is like my whole working thing. It's to work smarter, not harder, you know, to be more selective, all the stuff. Then I get into jewelry all of a sudden, like I'm telling you, oh, I'm listing a scarf slide that I sold for $18. I'm trying to be kind to myself and say that I'm in a learning phase. And that also there's nothing wrong with things that are easy to photograph and sell fast, but definitely the live show piece and the whole like, well, now I have hundreds of items that I can still run through live shows later, but maybe I should just list them. It's definitely dragging down my ASP a little bit. So yeah. I'm looking at my overall bottom line as opposed to looking at every individual piece. Like I'm not going to pick up Gap jeans anymore. That I'm done. I'm done with that, right? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stop picking up, you know, sandals that I think are going to sell for 25. But I'm okay right now with putting some jewelry pieces in for less as long as my overall sales volume, as long as my like skill at getting better at 
understanding the items that I'm buying and investing in is still leading me to make more money on everything else but the jewelry and the live shows. But I would say to you, think about putting some of the stuff in your closet because that's going to give you a really good testing ground, I feel like, Desiree, for seeing what people want. That's what's really intriguing to me is what I'm listing in my closet. Even if it didn't get bought in an individual show, what I'm listing in my closet and how quickly it sells and I'm starting to pick up on trends. And so then I know more what I'm looking for when I go shopping. Do you know what I mean? So that like, because you... There's, there's a couple resellers out there, some of whom I follow. I'm a really big fan of um, the Global Collective. And she has an entire like identity around the fact that you should not waste your time selling things for cheap when you could sell things for a lot more money. Oh, I need to follow her then. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> she, she has a course you can even take. And you know how like reseller courses, you're like, okay, I'm reselling. Like she is, <laughs> she is actually the real deal. And I have met with her in the past, actually, because I wanted to pivot to a higher ASP model. It requires a lot more bravery, right? Like I right. just threw down a thousand dollars on a lot of coach bags. Okay. Wow. Vintage, vintage coach bags. You know, it, this is not like, oh, okay, look, we've all had a good lucky flip at the bins where you bought it for two and sold it for a hundred, right? Like that's amazing. But a lot of the, if you want to increase in your closet, honestly, Desiree, like I would just take out and list the best items in your closet as opposed to listing just like anything, if you're going to go back into closet mode, you know what Are I mean? Are you talking about jewelry specifically mm -hmm. though? Yeah. I struggle with that because, and maybe you can help me figure this out because if I I'm listing it, <laughs> well, you might be compared to me. Okay. Uh, if I'm listing it in my closet, mm -hmm. let's say I, I put a necklace in there. Yeah. I'm asking, I don't know, $50 for it. Okay. If it's in my closet, then I don't want, I don't want, I feel like it's, it's tying up my inventory because I can take that same necklace, mm -hmm. putting it, put, do a live show. Mm -hmm. And maybe I may not get 50, maybe mm -hmm. I'll get 30, maybe I'll get 25. What, depending on where I start my bid, who's right. in the show, whatever. Totally. So to me, I've always done it where I have inventory that is listed in the mm -hmm. closet. And then yeah. I have live show inventory mm -hmm. because I mm -hmm. don't like feeling mm -hmm. like my inventory is tied up because mm -hmm. if it's listed in the closet and then I run it in the show and it sells, now I got to go back and delete that listing. So it's kind of like that's been mm -hmm. a, an internal struggle for me. Well, there's two <laughs> things. One. Yes. Help me out. I will, I will say this. <laughs> I have noticed that sometimes if people don't, so, so I will definitely bring something back to the show multiple times, even though I have a lot of really, really hardcore regulars, I will retire it for a few weeks and bring it back. So like if something doesn't sell right away, I'm not like immediately zeroing it out and needing to list it in my closet. But sometimes I will list items if I'm just not feeling like they're selling in the show, but they are potentially worth listing for something. And okay. you would not believe how many people, when they see them in my closet, ask for them in my show and are willing to pay more money for them. Okay. Oh, okay. They're willing... The two items last night that sold in my show for the most money were items that were in my closet. And because their starting price in my closet was higher, I could ask a higher price for them in the show than I would have if I purely showed them as show goods. Okay. Their mindset is that they can see that that value of that item in my closet. So if mm -hmm. I give them 30% off of that, you know, and I'm not doing it to screw with them, right? It's not like a strategy to make someone pay more. I really believe that that item could sell for that amount of money. I'm doing the research. I'm creating that value. But so what? So it just ends up being an item that I photographed that ends up selling in a show. But they were the two highest price sales that I had yesterday. Okay. And this happens to me all the time. I always tell people, go look in my closet, you know, see if there's anything else you like in there, you know? And even okay. you could, you could even... Some people do this strategy. Like, have you ever heard of people who before doing a sale on Poshmark will raise all their prices? Like yes. you raise them up and that way people can get a better deal on them. So, you know, you could even list things in your closet for more money than you would think it would sell at. And so if you give someone 25, 30, 40, 50% off in a show, if they ask for it, still making good money. Yeah, that's a really good idea because you can say, hey, if you're not buying it, like in your show, hey, you know, if you guys aren't interested in this now, but you change your mind, it will be in my closet, but the price may be a little bit more. And that well, may create some 
It does. But um, tell me this also. Are you like me? Do you have like regular loyalists? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have a okay. few that come to all my shows and they always buy at least one thing, mm -hmm. usually more. Or 12. <laughs> right, um, right. A, nurture those people. They are your besties and they will advocate for you and your shows to tell other people how good your shows are. They'll put, yes. I mean, I don't even ask them to do it, but like last night in my show, I was like, I called out a couple of my regular girlies because I always, I do a thing where I give a free gift to new buyers. So I'm like, Amethyst, because I call everybody by their show name because like, I, I, <laughs> even if you're in I 50 do too. shows, I do too. it's really hard to remember what your name is in real life. Amethyst's real name is Marcy, but anyway. So I'm like, Amethyst, uh, or mainly thrifted. If you're here, can you just tell them how good um, the free gifts were when you got them the first time you ordered? And then they're like, oh my God, they were so great. Or people will jump in the show and they'll be like, Lisa, I just opened my necklace and I love it so much. Like, so they, first of all, obviously are good advocates for you. But second of all, a lot of them will put things in bundles for me and then just be like, hey, what can you do for me on this? I sell an enormous amount to my regular customers from my closet. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right. So mm -hmm. I'm going to do that this week, this week, I'm going to put some stuff in, in my closet and I'm going to see how it goes just because we had like, this conversation. You, okay. <laughs> here's, here's my other, my, I love how I like build myself as an expert over here. I'm like, this is what you're going to do Desiree. Like as if I know. <laughs> well, you're you I compared to me, compared to me, you are. <laughs> so, so what I also do is if it's going to go in my closet, it has to have Again, I hate to like, well, I don't hate to reference tech all the time because I've learned a lot from him, but like <laughs> it has to be something worthy of the keywords or have a brand name. Right. So like I wouldn't just put something in if it's like a super pretty statement necklace, but it has no brand or whatever. But if you have the stuff that has all that buzz around it anyway, and it's going to do well theoretically in your closet. Yeah. I mean, and what's wrong, by the way, with listing something and then having a step down strategy? You listed it because you thought you could get $50. If it's been two months and you didn't get $50 or even $40, load it into the sh tray at your show and then offer to someone for $30. They're more likely to buy it than when you send auto offers. Yeah, that's true. And that is another reason why I like doing live shows, because live shows, you can liquidate mm -hmm. that that no name, unbranded okay stuff you can just say mm -hmm. hey blue beaded bracelet and someone loves it you know yeah <laughs> silver tone yeah. necklace oh yeah that's my thing mm -hmm. you know so it's been really nice for that mm -hmm. aspect of the live shows is like if you have a bunch of stuff that's mm -hmm. unbranded or unmarked and you don't know and and it's mm -hmm. just not selling because you can't figure out the mm -hmm. keywords a live show is an excellent way to move that inventory like you know especially me when i first started yeah. i bought a bunch of random stuff and i didn't know what i was doing and yeah. i said oh this looks pretty <laughs> let's buy that mm -hmm. you know but it didn't have any brand name on it or anything like that so yeah. i was able to kind of get rid of all of that stuff just from doing totally. live shows the first 30 the first show i told you about where i sold 30 something things literally they were all bags listed in my closet that hadn't sold mm-hmm you know, so mm -hmm. I absolutely it's it's such a good point. Right. You can use it to liquidate old stuff. But if you think about it, you could be on a rotating strategy. Then it's something I've actually testing right now, which is try to sell it in. a You know, if it's super special, put it aside, photograph it for the closet first. Right. If it doesn't sell, put it in a live show. Conversely, try to sell things in live shows multiple times. If they don't sell, put them in your closet. Then have a step down strategy where like months later, if it hasn't sold from your closet, bring it back into the live show. Because there's always new people. Do you know what I mean? And also, right. like, if you're anything like me, so my average show, I will admit, some of the hard part is how variable it can be. I can have a night where I sell 20 items and I can have a night where I sell 50 items. So that can be a hard part. But, like, in general, I feel like um, most of my people aren't going to, even my loyal people, they're not going to be like, she showed that cat brooch three shows ago. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Right. <laughs> so you can bring stuff back, you know, or like, I don't know if this happens to you, but I will have nights where people are like, give me clip on earrings. Like everyone in the room wants them. <laughs> and then other times where people are like, uh, no one wears clip on earrings. Right. You, know, you can't give it away. <laughs> it's happened to me with cloisonne. There are cloisonne <laughs> nights and there are no nights. Abalone. I sell a lot of Mexican silver and abalone jewelry, but some yeah. nights I'll bring out some of my best pieces. Nothing. Crickets, you know? I find it's just, yep. you, you got to see who's in the room and, you know, and to your point about personality, you got to hype it up. 
Yeah, yeah. So because I want to make sure we talk about that, too, because a yeah. lot of people are afraid to do live shows. Either they say, oh, I'm, I don't have the confidence to do it or mm -hmm. I'm camera shy or I don't know, you know, how to engage with people or whatever. So let's talk about, yeah, some of those mm -hmm. things that you and I both think are important if you are going mm -hmm. to do live shows as it relates to being able to handle it or, you know manage yeah. it or show up on camera or however you do it. Cause I I'm not on camera. I just show the item. Oh, see most jewelry sellers. I was just talking about this. All the jewelry <laughs> sellers are like, you don't see their face. They're just like, this is, you know, their hands are the only thing in the photo. Right. Uh -huh. um, That's how I do it. Just told me they like my jewelry shows. Cause they like that I'm there and I'm adding my personality. I've heard that a lot actually. Um, yeah, so I, I, should, I should try one just to see how it goes. Um, well, you're also like exceptionally like photogenic and all that kind of stuff too. Oh. So it's like you're, you're bringing a package, well, thank you. right? Think about it though. Live selling is selling yourself. Okay. Yes. Yes. It is. And you're a YouTuber, right? So you know that too. You, yes. you're, you wouldn't go on YouTube with just your voice. So, and it's so common in the jewelry space. I think it really personalizes it to have your like self in the picture, but that's just me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, personality. I think if you don't have a great personality, you should just bring really good stuff and run it really fast. Because yeah. what I will tell you is that shows that lost me were shows where the person is going on and on, like talking awkwardly, not showing enough stuff and not having a personality to keep me when they're not showing stuff. Like right. I have a friend, um, I don't know what her name is. I'm trying to remember if her closet is the same as like her username. Um, so on Instagram, her name is Tiffy Pie. I don't know if it's the same on um, Poshmark. She's adorable. So in her live shows, like if she just wants to like tell me all about what her day was like and what her dogs are doing, I would totally watch that, right? A lot <laughs> of people, I'm going to be honest, all right? This is maybe a controversial topic that we should talk about too. A lot of people are watching live shows because they're lonely. A lot of people oh, are watching yeah. live shows because they are craving human interaction. A lot of people are watching live shows because they don't have something else to do. And that's not everybody. I am in no way saying that. I believe Very that true. people want to connect with other people and that's what makes live selling so compelling. Again, which is why it's a testament to showing your face. But if you aren't gonna be able to bring that, and there, I have a lot of friends who are like, I would never do live selling, ever, ever, ever. I'm just not comfortable in front of the camera. To me then, bring really, really good stuff and just be like, here's a skims bodysuit size small run here's you know a doll's kill dress size medium run do you know what i mean like mm -hmm. i think you can be really successful if you bring the right things but i will tell you and this might be my bias or maybe me believing my own hype more than i should i think i sell a lot of this stuff I'm not saying that someone wants to be me or aspires to be me or thinks I'm cool, but like I get excited when I unbox something, I'm like, guys, it is a brooch of a f articulated clown. Like, look at his little feet. Look at his feet. They're going back and forth. How crazy is that? Oh my God. This is the craziest thing. Someone's got to get this. Oh my God. I do you the know, same thing. Right. I hype up, I hype up the stuff and I get so enthusiastic and mm -hmm. all of my people know that I have what I call a clasp fetish. And so when oh. I see a good, when I see a good class, oh my gosh, the angels are singing for me. <laughs> right. And for so they you. get excited about that too. Well, and they even tell me, they say, yeah, you know, because I watch your shows now mm -hmm. I'm picky about my class. I'm like, as you should be. <laughs> right. So, well, um, people, people just, get into it. I yeah, used to make this do. joke, right. I used to make this joke in my shows and I should bring it back because people loved it. I was referring to like for a while there, I had a run where like, people would come like the same people, a big group of them. This was back when I did the bundle. So I think the reason that most of them don't come anymore is they were getting really low cost of goods, bulk inventory. And so maybe what I do now doesn't appeal for them, but a lot of them would come every single week. They got to know each other. My chat would be on fire because they would be talking to each other, not just to me. They would be like, like having side conversations, getting to know each other. Oh, we know this one's having surgery. We know this one's grand granddaughter's coming. Whatever. I like that. <laughs> it was great, right? Yeah. We, I started joking that we were we should create our own she wolf pack. And so for a while, a lot of them would like even be like, "It's the she wolves." Like 
you're creating a personal connection, you're creating emotional, you know, response, you're creating um, a fear of missing out, you're and creating community. A validation, community, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. People were telling me, I remember being anxious and I had to break myself of it because it wasn't mentally healthy. People would ask me for good plans on Thursday nights and I would always turn them down because I would be like, it's show night. And then, you know, one night I was like, I'm going on vacation. I can't not have a show. Right. I mean, I can't have a show. So I didn't. And, you know, the next week people, I missed you. Thursday night is our night together. You know, like you build. Yes, they didn't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> that you build a relationship. And yes. I mean, think about infomercials. They don't have boring people on infomercials. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who you are does matter when you sell stuff. And like I said, I think the one way to get around it, sell really amazing stuff that sells itself. Yes. Yes. And I think confidence is a big thing. Like I'm mm -hmm. not saying you have to be the most confident person on the planet, but you have to be confident enough that you can do this and that no yeah. matter what kind of, you know, challenges we all have, Mm -hmm. that you can do this. You don't have to be, you know, a superstar, ultra bubbly person, mm -hmm. but you just have to have the confidence. And I really think the intention as well, that I just want to, I just want to make someone's day. This is what I say. I say, I just want to make your day. I want to send you something beautiful, yeah. something that you love, something mm -hmm. that you're going to enjoy and you're going to wear for however long. I mm -hmm. just want to make your day. Right. So if I you like that. this, let me know. If, if you don't like this, let me know. I said, I just, I really do. And that's really my intention. And that's, um, I think that's why I do have, I have some really loyal buyers who, and some of them don't buy anything, but they will come in. Just come hang will, out. Yeah. yeah, they will give me hearts. They will ask mm -hmm. questions. They will mm -hmm. share the show, you know, oh, and I'm right. just as appreciative of that too, you I know, agree. and um I really think if you come from it from that perspective that you truly just want to make someone happy with a pretty piece mm -hmm. of jewelry, then it doesn't matter really what your personality is. I mean, of course, obviously you can't just sit there like a brick mm -hmm. and not say anything, but. No, you don't have to be super chatty, but I think. Yeah, you I, don't. You really don't. You, you, it, it, there has to be some level of interest, right? Even if you're just a <laughs> matter of fact. It's looking like you actually want to be there, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, even if you're just matter of fact, you know, if you explain the history of it, so maybe you're not as good at like making funny jokes. Like I literally like make up songs during the show, which I'm sure is hardly embarrassing for myself, but I don't care. Um, but like, if you're not, <laughs> oh, now be, I got to watch this. <laughs> oh, totally. No, it's like, I'm, I'm like a little, I'm kooky. I think that's part of like, it's, it's my thing. You either like it or you don't. It was polarizing when I was younger. You know, I think now people enjoy whimsy more, hopefully in adults, but, um, but yeah, I would say, what if you're really knowledgeable? Like if I was watching someone who wasn't super interesting, but they could tell me more, like, I'll be like, guys, okay. So this necklace says, um, like such and such on it. Like last night I was doing this. I was, I've learned that Sarah Coventry. So I, I get a lot of Sarah Coventry jewelry. I don't know. She's I like, the, I, she must be like the Ann Taylor loft of whatever era she was from. But anyway, mm -hmm. and I, I'm like, and I'm like, it's signed all different ways. I mean, I've seen Sarah Cove or Cove. I've seen, um, SAC. S I've seen, SB. Right. I've seen just Coventry, like seen all these yep. things. Right. And then someone goes, oh, well, yeah, that's based on the era that they're from. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know that. Right. So I would watch someone that was like, so this is Sarah Coventry. You can see by the back that it says, you know, as you know, SC, this would be between 1980 and 1985. And typically her period, you know, like, even if you're not like, even if you're not like me or you, right. Who have these big, like big personalities, I would watch that. Or I know I've done this before too. If I'm not super pumped about the seller, but the show sounded interesting, I will look in their tray. Now, admittedly, neither you or I have a tray that can keep people, right? <laughs> right. We don't, that's not our thing anymore. <laughs> but I would say that's the other thing. If you're worried that you don't have a good personality for selling, take photos or good, give good descriptions of what the things are going to be that are in your show. Because then I would often do that. I would go preview and I'd be like, oh, okay. I like that t-shirt. I'm going to go request it now and ask if they'll run it now, you know, things like that. But I've also seen um, sellers who are more nervous that won't do things out of order. And I think yeah. that's, a mistake. I think that's a mistake yeah. because you're going to lose them. They're not, if they see that your item is 48th that they want and you're on number three, like mm, I'm not sticking around for that. 
Yeah, I think that's why um, some sellers, some sellers don't do the trade like how we talked about because they don't mm -hmm. want to be thrown off by somebody saying, yep. can you show me item 52 and mm -hmm. you're only on item number eight, you know? Yeah. No, I've uh, definitely seen that though. Honestly, I've been yeah. like, I've seen people be like, I'm running the show in order. And like, I fully respect that, but I'm also not staying. Well, I've had people actually come back, you know, oh, they'll yeah? see something. Oh, yeah. Clever. Like, like I had um, a lady the other day, she came in, she bought some stuff mm -hmm. and she said, I have to go do whatever. She's like, but mm -hmm. I'll be back. And I, and mm -hmm. you, you know how yeah, you think, I do oh, yeah, that. right. Yeah, right. They're not coming back. But sure enough, she came back well, and then she was like, what did I miss? <laughs> well, Poshmark, right? wanted me did, to show her. Poshmark did something really smart. I don't know if this was happening back when you used to sell, um, when you started selling, because I was selling much earlier. It used to be that you leaving the room triggered the closing of your ticket. So that essentially, if you were there in my show and oh, bought two I things, see. you left my show, came back an hour later, new shipping fee, new order it wouldn't be considered oh, one no. order. It was separating it. So that was like a real huge disadvantage, which is completely changed. That, or is that still how mm -hmm. it is? No, now it's, they wait till the end of the show and then they like close it all out together based on the username at the end of show completion. And can we talk okay. about how they threw us a freaking bone and gave us 15 second bids? It is changed. Oh yes. My life was changed that day. <laughs> oh my God. Wasn't oh. yours changed that day too? Oh, <laughs> no, like I had literally been telling people once I had tried whatnot, I was like, guys, because it's an eternity. Just it is. Honestly, think about it. If you're holding it up truly something is. for 30, try, try, like we did this right now and I actually held this up for 30 seconds. It's a really long time if no one wants it. If no one wants it. Right. And you're and you're not getting any bids on it. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And did you notice this? OK, because I just had this mm -hmm. issue happen in my show this week. Okay. There was a lady using Apple Pay. She could not use the, I could not run 15 seconds because I guess it takes longer than 15 seconds for the payment to clear when you're no. using Apple Pay. So she had tried, like I ran it, she tried to bid, she said, I'm using Apple Pay and for some reason it's not going through. Then somebody huh. in, in the chat said, oh yeah, because it takes, you need to run it for 30 seconds because it takes that long for Apple Pay to clear the payment. So what I had to do for really? her. 30? Yeah, so for her. Yeah. So I had to run it for 30 seconds and then she was able to bid using Apple pay, but I had never heard of that before. And I don't know if Poshmark is aware of that. You issue. should tell them. I have not seen that. Um, what I have seen, and this used to happen all the time and it doesn't happen as often. Again, I think they're calling their system servers differently because used to have things where people who are buying eight, nine, 10 items, one, 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 one after another, their mm -hmm. payment would start getting declined by their credit card because the card charges would look suspicious because there were so many purchases. Oh, in, and in back to card. back to back. Yeah. So they did yeah. fix that. But I do have things where people still, their cards still get flagged because I'll have people that oh. will, will be buying, everything will be fine. And then all of a sudden I'll get a notification that the payment declined. I and got that too them. a few times. Mm -hmm. But this is interesting. Don't count those people out. I have one buyer in particular. It seems to happen to her and her card every time. It drives her nuts. And she always goes, can you just put them aside? I'm going to call the bank in the morning. And every time the next morning, it she gets it fixed. Now, I do have to create an, a special new order for her because her mm -hmm. payment declined on several of her items. So you and just make a listing, a order. special listing for her? Mm -hmm. I just make the yeah. custom listing for her and every time it works. But I do think that's one of the challenges, right, um, is the way that you process, obviously, the credit card. So that Apple Pay thing is incredibly interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, what? if in one of your next shows, if you're doing mm -hmm. 15 seconds and someone keeps saying I'm bidding, but it's not going through, ask yeah. them if they're using Apple Pay, because if they are, you're going to have to run it for 30 seconds. But see, oh. the problem is that when I run it for 30 seconds for one particular person, like this also happened to somebody else jumped in and bid mm. and then ended up winning the item that was supposed to be for the lady <laughs> who only wanted, who right. was using Apple pay. And that happened. Mm. And then like, what could I do? You know, I couldn't, mm. I couldn't like, un like undo it mm. at least not right then and there. So, mm. um, I don't know, like I said, I don't know if it's something mm. that Poshmark is aware of, or maybe it's mm. just, it just happened in that one time. I don't know, but, um, that that's really kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky because I also have some people like I, I had a lady who 
had never bid before. She didn't understand how it worked. And so when I did 15 seconds, she was trying to figure out how to bid. And she kept saying, I'm trying to bid. I'm trying to bid. Yep. But this is my first, my very first show, my very first auction. She's like, yeah. I don't know. People were telling her the blue button and you all this the stuff. Button. <laughs> yeah. No, but okay. The thing was, is I had to run it for 30 seconds because she needed the extra time. I'm, I'm assuming she was maybe an elderly lady or something. Mm -hmm. But, I've had to run things multiple times because people like yes, missed it or they couldn't figure yes. it out. And I'm like, all right, one more time. We got this. <laughs> Speaking of which, I want to ask you a question. This is very okay. controversial. I do belong to a number of different Poshmark like Facebook groups, um, me too. which most of the time make me want to punch myself in the face. They're not like text group, right? <laughs> like they're not smart right. people having an interesting conversation. They're people being like, Poshmark is horrible. And I'm like, it's not really that bad. Um, but people claiming that they've had their phones purchase things from live shows that they weren't even in or touching their phones during. Do you think this is really possible? I'm fascinated by this. So somebody is saying that they weren't even in a live show, but somehow mm -hmm. a purchase was made on their account in that live show that they were not in. They're saying their phone did it. Like they're not saying that someone hacked their account. They're saying that their phone got jostled somehow, in their pocketbook. Yeah. That and it somehow opened up the app, opened up the show, <laughs> bid on the but bid. I bid right, bid one. <laughs> but I've heard this like many times, like not just once or twice, like many times. And I'm like, is this one of those things where I think it's fake until it happens to me with like a fifteen hundred dollar handbag or something? I don't know. Yeah, you know what? Because it happened to me. It did happen oh. to me. Now here's here's what it was. Okay. I was watching a show. Mm -hmm. I was just watching. Because mm -hmm. I saw, oh, this lady has really nice stuff. So I'm just going to mm -hmm. watch. I had no intention of mm -hmm. buying. So I had my phone, you know, up and mm -hmm. I have it on this little prop thing. And mm -hmm. I was eating. Well, when I was eating, my elbow hit the phone screen and it bid. I, and I was not trying to buy anything. Now, luckily, it was only $5. Okay. It was a nice bracelet. So I just went ahead and bought it. But right. the thing was, is I said, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. It actually happened to me. <laughs> okay. I accidentally well, bid on I, something. I, I believe that more. <laughs> that I can work with, right? You were at least looking yeah, at your I was, I was, I was I was These are people cleaning. They were across <laughs> the room. And this happens. Then. Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. But I don't want to yeah. talk too much crap about it in case it happens to me. And then I will be a living testimony of it. You'll so. be just like me. Like, you'll, you'll just right? be watching a show. And because... Maybe your kid comes in and gives you a hug. Well, they mm -hmm. hit the screen and lo well, and behold, I, you bid. <laughs> I have to tell you, when I mentioned to you earlier that I bought a thousand dollars with the coach bags, that really wasn't so bad for me in terms of like the investment. What was bad was I had put a high bid in an auction that I assumed I would get outbid for at the last minute. And I accidentally won it. Like I had wanted to see how much the auction went for. I hadn't right. actually planned to win the auction because I get alerts if someone outbids me and they always outbid you at the last minute. Yeah, so it wasn't an accidental bid. I actually did bid on purpose, but I did not bid to win except that I did. Oops. Well, <laughs> I'll be okay. it's going to be good though. It's going to be it's good. Gonna be fine. I sell vintage coach <laughs> bags all day. I just sold one 20 minutes before I got on the phone with you. So I think it'll be okay. But yes, you know, there's a lot of risks in impulse buying, which I think is a big thing. Okay. Can we talk about this for a second? I feel that some of my buyers might be compulsive shoppers. And oh, it makes absolutely. Me it makes Absolutely. me feel a little bad sometimes. Like I worry, like I don't want to be like aiding and abetting them. Like not that I want to stop them from, you know, I want them to, to enjoy themselves, but like I worry about some of them. How, how, you know, they buy so much from me. But the thing is, is if they weren't spending it with you, they would spend it with someone else because that's what they're going to do. So you know what I mean? Like if someone you know. has a buying habit, mm -hmm. they're going to buy. It's either going to be you, it's going to be me, yeah. it's going to be <laughs> whoever else. Right. So I don't worry. And nobody's forcing anybody to to buy anything, you know, and I'm not trying to mm -hmm. say. That's true. You know, I'm not trying to, to be, um, what would the word be, you know, unsensitive about that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is I'm not forcing anybody and it's their choice to be on there. Yeah. You know. And it's probably making them really happy, hopefully. Yeah. And that's what they want to do, you know, and if they're not spending it with me, like I said, they could be spending it at Target, mm -hmm. spending it yeah, at Macy's, 
<laughs> spending it at uh, wherever. So, point. but um, I do want to close out with some tips. Let's just talk about if someone wants to do Poshmark live shows to okay. sell jewelry specifically, okay. what are some tips, advice, tricks, whatever that mm. you would tell to that person? Okay. I would say, first of all, if you haven't done live shows before, expect that you'll make mistakes, especially in your first mm -hmm. couple of shows. Yeah. In the span of me learning this, you know, I'm like, I've got my box and I've got my measuring tape and I've got this. I mean, <laughs> My tripod collapsed one time during a live show. Oh, that's one, happened to me a couple times. <laughs> one time my cat froze and I didn't think anyone was talking to me for an hour and I almost had a meltdown. Last <laughs> night, my daughter had an emergency during a show and I had to end it early. Like yeah. she came in in the middle of the show. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know, but like life happens. That happens. Yeah. So stuff happens. that would be one of my first ones is like, be real. I don't, I don't necessarily think you have to put, a lot of people put it in their titles. I'll get alerts. Like so-and-so is like my first show. Like, I don't think you have to do that necessarily, but it's okay mm -hmm. to be like, guys, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, we're just going to have an adventure together. Right. I yeah. think that, yeah. that's, that's one of my tips. Another one would be to or be organized, have a plan. So whatever your plan is, it doesn't have to be what I do, but have a plan that'll keep you organized in a way that feels manageable to you. Um, because like I said, the, the numbering system that I use or then use, it really cuts down on error. So that's really yeah, good. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, it's okay. Oh, speaking of errors, I've had pieces of jewelry I'm showing and they fall apart while I'm showing them. Like <laughs> I've had that too. Or like you, you don't notice a missing stone and right? suddenly and I'm like, Oh no, I'm sorry. Sorry. I can't sell this to you. <laughs> Nobody bit on this. That happened to me last night. Um, so I would say do inspect your pieces beforehand just in case to help. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say bring a lot more things than you expect to sell for yes. every item I sell. There's probably at least one item I don't sell. Don't be afraid to run things more than once. Um, I said this last night to my group and it was really interesting. I did a cert, like an unofficial survey because, you know, my shows are small, as I mentioned, I would say last night, for example, because now Posh does that pop up of the stats for you at the end. So you can see the yes. data, right? I love that. I didn't used to do that. I love it. I take a screenshot of it every time. So it blew my mind because in my shows, usually I will have around 10 to 15 people active at any given time. I am really niche. I'm a really small show. So if you would ask me how many people came through my show, I asked, I asked everybody last night, I said, how many do you think come through one of my shows? People were like 40, 60, 80, 200 to 350 people seem to pass through my shows over two and a half hours. Wow. I would never know that. Never. So- right. You might have run a bracelet at, you know, like I do at 930 crickets, crickets run the same bracelet at 11 o'clock and five people bid on it. Right, so don't right. assume that just because you showed an item once that it's not going to sell. I would say that. I would also say um, you could also start small on your first show. If you feel overwhelmed with the idea of having a lot of stuff, don't plan on trying to max out to 50 items. Do 15, you know? Um, yeah, and then that's I think what I did. Easy. Yeah. Right. And then I think mm -hmm. the basic things that we talked about earlier, maximize whatever is the best thing it is that you have. So is it your knowledge? Is it your personality? Is it the inventory that you have? Um, is it something else? Like, are mm -hmm. you, I've always thought like, it'd be really cool if I had like, like I follow a woman on um, YouTube who, who does like accurate historical recreation, uh, re sorry, recreation of outfits. And she dresses as if she's from the 1950s. I've always oh, thought, yes. like, I think I I've feel seen bad. That. I feel bad when I'm, when I'm selling vintage clothing and vintage jewelry that like, I'm not like in a kooky hat. So like maybe <laughs> that could be your thing. You don't have a huge personality, but you dress the part, you know? Um, don't do it without a ring light, my friends. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't. I was going to add that. I was going to say you need good lighting. You, you really, need. really do. Yep. But if you don't have a lot of money for a ring light, you would be amazed at how cheap they are on Amazon. They are yeah. real cheap. You can get them for a very reasonable amount and they're great for all sorts of things. Um, I have a ring light on right now on my desk that I'm talking to you on because I'm in Zoom, I'm in you know Teams and Zoom meetings all day for work. And here, I'm going to show you because this is really interesting. Ready? So look at the glamour. Look at the glamour. <laughs> yes, let's see. Oh, wow. It makes a huge That's difference. A huge difference. Yeah. Would you rather talk to me, buy from me, watch me with the light on or not? So I go ring light all the way. Um, 
I don't have the nicest hands, but I try to at least keep them manicured. If you're going to show jewelry with or without Me your too. face, I would get your nails done. Yeah. And at least have them like clean. Cause I can't tell you, I see, and I see this more with the men who sell jewelry. Mm -mm. They have sometimes not clean fingernails. And to what? me, that is a huge turnoff. <laughs> Like I'm I see like it more on what times right now by you telling me this. Like I can't, I can't even imagine that. How would you? But this is the men. This is the men who sell because you know how some I of these care. guys. Come yeah, on. I agree. I agree. But you know how some of these guys buy like the storage units and they get jewelry right. and they're like, yeah. okay, let me sell the jewelry yeah. and their hands are just no scary. Hard and, pass. Um, Hard pass. But I'm the same way. I always have my nails done. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to make sure I throw some lotion on so my skin's not dry. <laughs> right. Um, you know, because I always picture it like, because sometimes they'll ask you, they'll say, oh, can you put on the ring? Can you put yeah. on the bracelet? Mm -hmm. You know, and you want to make sure that you feel confident doing that right. because sometimes they want to see how it looks on. You know, and I would also say to invest mm -hmm. in, in the props, you know, the little neck. Mm -hmm. Because they want to see yeah. what the necklace looks like on, not just you I holding it up. The neck. I never you do don't? the neck. I occasionally I put it on. I neck. never do the neck. I have like, you know, those what, those display ones. Oh, maybe I'll bring that to my next show. You should because they, they mm -hmm. want to see it. And um, it kind of gives them something to look at while you're mm. digging out your next piece. That's how I've kind of used it. Like and uh, mine... We've given her a name. Her name is Sylvia. So I tell everybody, I say, yeah, Sylvia and I, I got to put Sylvia to work, you know, because yeah. that's her job is to show you guys this stuff. And they get a kick out of it. They that's love funny. it. And then sometimes it's funny because it's a it's a long running joke now. And my regulars, they'll say, where's yeah. Sylvia? <laughs> is she exactly. working today? <laughs> You've created a personality for your, uh, for your necklace. Yeah, oh, yeah. Another good one. Go to the bathroom first. Yes. Go to the bathroom and, and have some water. Bring beverages. I'm like self conscious, so I'm not drinking um, on this chat with you. But like normally, I'm like swinging beverages like left and right. I have like an evening soda that I that I drink because it's got caffeine to keep me awake while we're doing the show and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm like, guys, it's Diet Coke time. You know, like. Um, yeah, and they understand. They know. Too. They know that because you're talking for two hours straight. Mm -hmm. So you know, you're going to need some water because your, your throat and your mouth will get dry. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I've gotten compliments on is uh, where I show my jewelry. It's a very uh, clear kind of like minimalist space. Like I've had people say, I really like how you display your jewelry. It's so nice and uncluttered. And, um, you know, because it's not just a bunch of junk just kind of thrown yeah. in there. And then you're, cause I've seen shows like that where you see all kinds of random stuff in the background or, mm -hmm. or they've just got a massive pile of jewelry and they're just um, kind of showing you whatever's on top. Oh, and I've done that too. Yeah. I've done that too. Cause sometimes we do have um, dig show, like I call them dig shows where oh, you're fun. digging. And sometimes they like that. They just say, yeah. Oh, what's that pink thing? Or what is that mm -hmm. blue thing? You know? But I haven't done one of those in a while because I haven't had a massive pile of jewelry. But um, yeah. make your space where you're showing the jewelry aesthetically pleasing because mm -hmm. they do notice it. They do pay attention to those things. That's a good point. I am um, at one point I, I bought a um, a crocheted uh, like afghan, which is not mm -hmm. normally my style, but I found like a really amazing one. And I put it on the back of my couch and people love it. And they commented on all of my shows. I will admit though, I don't think I have a clean, clean aesthetic Desiree in my shows. I often have like, there's no a behind me, but people know it's because I'm going to unbox them. Right. Like I'm at least. Well, that's to, different. Like, that's part of your show. Yeah. But yeah, I'm it's, talking it's, about how, like I saw one girl, she had a McDonald's food bag in the background. No, she mm -hmm. had like cat food like her cat food bowl right. dish with like just all this stuff that just looked really mm -hmm. um, cluttered, yeah. you know, and, and maybe some people don't care about that stuff. You know, maybe they're fine with it. But for me, sure. I like to have a really nice presentation. I like to show that I'm putting some effort in it, that I'm, I, I want it to be an experience. You know, I don't want it to just be like, turn on the camera and whatever happens, happens. <laughs> You know, but maybe I, that's just me. Maybe that that's just sense, me. Right. I think 
I think that's probably why you're successful is because you are thinking through these things, you know? So maybe, maybe, you know, but because I want, well, here's, here's why, because I don't know if you know, I have a background in uh, news. I was a news mm -hmm. reporter and a traffic reporter. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things when you look at branding and when you look at a certain um, uh, way that you're presenting yourself, I want people to know that when they're scrolling through the shows, they recognize my show because they recognize my yes, background. They recognize, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it's all part of the branding. So I, I want my shows to have a certain look because yeah. I want them to be recognized as people are scrolling through all the shows. Well, so that's um, my Afghan now. Yes. Yes. So people mm -hmm. will know, like, even if they don't know your name or if, right. if they don't know who you are, they like, oh, wow, this is really nice. I love her setup. Because I've had mm -hmm. people tell me that too. They say, I just like your mm -hmm. setup. I say, oh, mm -hmm. thank you. I appreciate that. You know, so. I feel like we got to get you on FaceTime though. I mean, <laughs> you got to do it. Bring, bring well, I mean, Desiree to the table. Well, you know, some days, you know, this takes work. It's not like I just wake up, you know, yeah. looking, looking, you know, my best, um, you know, and some days I have a lot of shows like, a week. You could have one show be like, it's Desiree's face day. <laughs> well, you know, I might try that. I might try that just because, because you, you, you're having really good success showing your face. Yeah. Um, and but I always thought it was fair. distracting. Yeah. I mean, it could be, that's definitely fair. And to be fair, I'm having what I consider to be success for me right now. And because mm -hmm. I find it to be fun I've made real friends. The woman who designed my website was one of my best show buyers. And we just started talking yep. and it turns out she does web design. And you're making you know, money. Right. Um, I'm making money um, mm -hmm. that's supplemental to what I'm already doing in my closet. I'm creating a new source for me to get inventory. So all those things are success. But like, don't get it twisted. I'm not making ten or twenty thousand dollars a month selling, you know, jewelry on on Poshmark. It's not to say right. that I'm not either. Happen. Right. It's not to say it couldn't happen. I'm just saying like you can also do it and just do it as a side hobby. Even, you know, like you said, like, for example, I definitely want you back and listing in your closet. I think that's a yes for sure. But like, oh, yeah, that's going to happen. Right. Yeah. You have to do it. But like even if you I mean, look, for me, I'd say like on the best months, I maybe made like three or four K from live selling, like, which is amazing for me, right. Doing it one night a week. And on the really, really like months, you know, maybe it's like a thousand bucks or whatever, but you know, I keep my um, buy costs pretty low. So that's still really fun to go live one night a week and, you know, have some extra money in your pocket to do something every month. Like, and I think I, I will tell people, if you're considering doing live selling of any kind, I think jewelry is one of the best things you can do or bags. And the reason why is, yes, potentially your ring or bracelet width might depend on what size you are. But in general, everyone can wear jewelry, whereas not everybody fits into a certain size blazer or a pair of jeans or even likes that, you know, yeah. style, right? Yeah. If you get, even if you're one of the bigger show people, even if you have 50 or 100 people in your show, maybe 20 of them are a size eight. And of those 20, do any of them really need that sweater that you're selling, right? <laughs> But like, and there are tons of successful clothing sellers. So don't, I'm not trying to act like it's not, but if you're nervous about starting shows, any kind of hard good or anything that is not size dependent, I think gives you a lot more room and possibility to sell. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, reselling jewelry, mm -hmm. it's, it's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. Oh, I don't know what... <laughs> I have never seen that before. And I don't if you know. You have an iPhone and you make certain hand gestures. I think things can come out of your hands. Oh, I don't <laughs> okay. Know. I've never seen that. Well, I you am. Matter, like, I got to tell you, your, your computer was really excited about what you were doing <laughs> and it just wanted to celebrate you with balloons. Yeah. Okay. So for those of you who are uh, listening to only the audio of the right. audio version of this podcast, uh, some balloons just magically flew across the screen. So we're trying to <laughs> figure out what, what that was. But um, now I forgot what I was even saying. But anyway. Uh, I think it was something about if you're going to sell jewelry in live shows, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, so is, our, if, what is our summary statement, Desiree? Yeah. So if, if you are going to sell 
Oh, that's what I was saying. Okay. So selling jewelry is simple, but it's not necessarily easy because it does require a little bit of knowledge, right? You can't mm -hmm. just pick up a piece of jewelry and expect you're going to flip it for a hundred, 200, whatever. Right. right. So you do need to have a little bit of knowledge, but the thing is, is most people have some jewelry knowledge of something that they like anyway. Like some people mm -hmm. love Trafari or oh, yeah. they love Monet. So they know a little bit about that, or they mm -hmm. love gold or silver or mm -hmm. whatever it may be. But the thing is, is jewelry really is an easy sell once you know what you're doing. And it doesn't take long mm -hmm. for you to front load that knowledge. I mean, yeah, you'll have to maybe do a little bit of research or read some books or watch some videos, whatever. But uh, yeah, it's amazing. And the thing is, is it's because I've had people who told me they got into selling jewelry because they have limited mobility or yep. they have disabilities and they needed something mm -hmm. that was easy to handle and not heavy to lift or heavy to package, you know, and so something they can carry and, and, and easily deal with. And so there's a lot of advantages to selling jewelry, but live show selling to me is my jam. I absolutely love it. I don't yeah. think I, I will never stop doing it just because I love it mm -hmm. so much. And I was on another podcast a couple nights ago and I was telling, mm -hmm. I was telling them, yeah, my dream job would be to be on like QVC or oh, HSN selling the jewelry. I was jewelry. Gonna say. I, was I like, would love to do that. See? Wow. Yeah. So. I think, look, if you look at China, they're a multi, multi-billion dollar business in live selling. It is only going to get more prevalent, you know, and I think we're mm -hmm. early adopters and that gives us a lot of opportunity to, to really test and try things and to be first movers on something that's really exciting. Yeah. So... I mean, I can't think of anything else that uh, we haven't talked about as it relates to this. Can you? <laughs> uh, I'm quite a talker. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's one thing that just popped in my head. Uh, when you are mm -hmm. starting your live shows, it's because this is what I always do. I always have a goal mm -hmm. for each show, like either mm -hmm. how many pieces I want to sell or a dollar amount okay. that I want to make mm -hmm. or maybe uh, how long I want to stay on. Because mm -hmm. when you have a goal, because sometimes you may not hit the money goal. So yeah. I say, okay, I'm going to stay on for at least an hour or mm -hmm. uh, I want to make at least, you know, $200 or $300 or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So, and then usually once I hit one of those goals, like let's say I hit $200 in 45 mm -hmm. minutes. Well, now I can say, well, do I want to stay on for an hour or do I not want to stay on for an hour? Well, so, you know, you reminded me of something else that I would give somebody as advice. I've had shows where I was on for three hours and there was a section in the middle for like 45 minutes where I literally sold nothing and mm -hmm. was like, I am a loser. Nobody loves me. I should just crawl in a hole. You know, like my brain starts going like to a real dark place. And then so many times it's turned around. Some of my best nights so at the true. end have had parts in the beginning or the middle that were like, you know, flames coming out of my head on fire, you know, badness. So I would just say, stick with it and give yourself a chance and make relationships. So maybe, you do, maybe you only sell a couple pieces the first show, but if people really love the pieces and they like the way you package them and they like talking to you, they'll come to your next one. So just be yeah. patient and be optimistic, I think more than anything. Yeah. And you just reminded me of another tip. Sometimes you'll you'll do a show, you'll start and something's just not vibing. Something's mm -hmm. off. Something's not flowing it's okay to end that show and then come mm -hmm. back on an hour later or maybe that night or mm -hmm. maybe two hours later. Cause I've done that too, where I've been on, it's been 30 minutes, nothing's happening. So I get off and then mm -hmm. maybe that night I get back on and boom, you know, mm -hmm. we're rocking and rolling and people are buying and everybody's happy and it's a big party. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big jewelry party. So yeah, mm -hmm. you'll have to find your groove when you do this and you'll have to find what works for you. And the only way to do that is literally to jump in, get started and do it. Mm -hmm. Love it. So, okay, Lisa, we had a fabulous conversation and um, I just want to thank you so much for mm -hmm. spending this time with me and sharing your insights and your knowledge and your experience. Uh, I will have all of Lisa's information linked for you either in the description of this video or in the show notes if you're listening to the audio only version. Um, anything else you want to close out with, Lisa? 
Thank you so much for having me, Desiree. This was really fun. And I feel like we're going to have to talk more offline about jewelry. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, I'm and yeah, this is definitely not going to be our last conversation. Mm -mm. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank all right. You so Thank much. you so much.